Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at how social facilitation influences performance. Why does having other people around us often make us perform better as an individual athlete? What implications does this have for coaching? And how is this effect being changed by performance monitoring technology? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, a look at social facilitation of performance, or in other words, how the presence of others can make us perform better, or sometimes worse. Before I dig into the research on this topic, I want to tell you a little bit about where the inspiration for it came. Last week I ran the Santan Scramble 50k race here in Arizona. When I towed the start line, I had a rough idea of the time that I thought I might finish, and started out at a pace pretty consistent with that. But about a mile into the race, I was joined by a runner who I'd met in a previous race, and we chatted and ran together for the next 20 miles or so. And in the end, I finished the race about an hour faster than I had anticipated. I really believe that having someone to run with made a huge difference. By the way, if you're interested, you can hear all the gory details about this race on the new podcast I just launched called Ultra Running Science and Superstitions. You can find it at perceptionaction.com forward slash URSS. The other reason that social facilitation has always fascinated me is it is commonly recognized as the very first topic ever studied in sports psychology. In a paper called The Dynamogenic Factors in Pacemaking and Competition, published in the American Journal of Psychology in 1898, Norman Triplett from Indiana University sought to understand the effect other riders had on the performance of a cyclist. In looking at the records of cyclists, he noted that their time trial performance was always better, by at least 25%, when other cyclists were riding at the same time. This was true both when they were directly competing against each other and when they weren't. To bring this phenomenon into the lab, Triplett developed an experimental task in which children had to spin a fishing reel. Consistent with his cycling observations, most children reeled faster when they were side by side with another participant as compared to when they were by themselves. So, this was really the first report of something we now accept as fact. That is, people perform differently when others are present, even when they're not directly interacting. In his paper, Triplett proposed that these effects were primarily due to competition. As he put it, the presence of another person stimulated one's competitive instinct, leading to a great concentration of energy. So we perform better on competition. Pretty obvious finding. But, as it turns out, researchers inspired to follow up this early work revealed that there is more to the story. In the early 1920s, Gordon Allport further studied the effect observed by Triplett. In his experiments, Allport tried to deliberately remove any competition effects. Even when participants were instructed to, quote, avoid comparing themselves to others and not consider the situation as competitive, unquote, the same basic effects were found. That is, better performance in a group as compared to when acting alone. From this, he coined the term that we now use social facilitation, defined as an increase in response merely from the sight or sound of others making the same movement. Note that this social facilitation is different from what we might call the audience effect, because in Triplett and Allport studies, the other people present were co-actors, that is they were doing the same task, not just sitting there watching. Of course, performance can also be affected by the presence of others just observing. Although I think there are potentially some interesting differences between whether the other people present are doing the same task as you, or just observing, these two things were pretty much lumped together in research after triplet. And in general, most lab studies have used audiences rather than co-actors to remove competition as a variable. 
Another important contribution of Allport's work, and the studies by other researchers that followed soon after, was to note that the presence of others did not always facilitate performance, and in fact for some people it made it get worse. There are several theories that have been put forth to explain the two sides of this social facilitation coin. In 1965, Zajonk proposed the theory that I see cited most commonly in the literature, one based on activation theory. This theory proposes that the presence of others serves to increase drive or arousal. Whether this results in facilitation or impairment of performance depends on the nature of the task, and is an extension of a very well-known effect in psychology called the inverted U or yerkes dodson law. I've included a couple of figures that illustrate this in the show notes. The basic idea is that we perform best at a moderate level of arousal or drive. If we put too little effort in, for example because we don't really care about the outcome, or we try too hard, our performance is worse. Furthermore, the optimal level of arousal depends on task difficulty. For easier tasks, the optimal level is much higher than for complex or difficult tasks. There is also a skill level effect. For the same task, for example chipping a golf ball, the optimal level of arousal will be higher for a more skilled performer. These are things I think most coaches know intuitively. You don't push too hard or add a lot of distractions when you're working with novices or trying to implement a new difficult play. Returning to social facilitation, Zajonk's activation theory proposes that the increased arousal or drive produced by the presence of others will be good when the task is simple and or the performer is highly experienced, while it will be bad when the task is more complex or we're dealing with novice performers. I think this has some interesting implications for when it's best to introduce a crowd in practice. As I mentioned, there have been several other models put forth to explain social facilitation including ones based on distraction, overload, feedback, and self-presentation. Self-presentation is our desire to strive to create an impression of competence when in the presence of others. An interesting more recent twist on explaining social facilitation was provided by Jim Blasevich and colleagues in 1999. In this study, Blasevich's biopsychosocial model of stress was applied to social facilitation. I've talked about this a few times on the podcast now, but for those that don't remember, the basic idea of this theory is that how we perform under stress or pressure depends on whether we interpret the situation as a challenge or a threat, something which can be assessed by looking at our cardiovascular response. In this particular study, Blasevich and colleagues had people perform either a well-learned or not-learned task in front of an audience. As predicted, the well-learned condition essentially produced a challenge situation, with participants having increased cardiac response and decreased vascular resistance, while performing the unlearned task in front of the crowd produced a threat response, that is, increased cardiac response with increased vascular resistance. Excluding Triplett's original study, the research I've discussed has mostly involved highly cognitive tasks, for example solving word problems. In 2002, Strauss examined how social facilitation affects more motor-based tasks like we see in sports. For this, he split research studies into those that have examined primarily tasks that involve conditioning, for example running and weightlifting, with those that primarily involve coordination for example dribbling a soccer ball. For coordination tasks, the results are highly inconsistent, with some showing clear social facilitation effects and others showing no effects at all. Two things that come out in the studies that do show significant results are that during learning, participants perform worse in the presence of an audience than when they're alone. After some time has passed though, and the task has been learned, performance improves in front of an audience compared with solitary conditions. These effects are of course directly in line with Zhejiang's activation model I described earlier. Another factor that seems to be important here is whether or not the audience has evaluative power, that is whether they are judging or just watching. For primarily conditioning tasks, research has shown that the presence of an audience more consistently results in improved performance. 
An interesting example of this was a study of running by Worringham and Mezick in 1983. They examined the running speed of 36 joggers on a 90-yard stretch of footpath at the University of Santa Barbara in California. The runners did not actually know they were part of the study. They were just out for their workout. All runners covered the first 45 yards alone. One third of the participants then covered the next 45 yards alone. A second third of the participants ran past a woman who sat reading with her back to them at the midway point of the run, while the final third ran past a woman, but she was now facing them. Results showed that it was only in the woman facing condition that the runners increased their speed significantly in the second half compared with the first 45 yard stretch. The authors propose that this shows that it is the evaluated potential of other people that is important in social facilitation, not just their mere presence. I think an interesting new twist on social facilitation effects comes when we consider the performance monitoring technology. There has been some research done looking at the effect of workplace cameras on performance, which has found it produces mostly negative effects early on until people begin to essentially ignore them. But I want to come back around to my running and give an example that, to my knowledge, has not been studied. The effect of social networks that track performance. When I do a run, the data collected from my Garmin device gets automatically uploaded to Strava when I finish. If you don't know, Strava is a website and app used to track athletic activity, mostly cycling and running. The reason I think it has been so successful is that it allows for a lot of social interaction. You can follow others so you can see their activity in your feed. This includes a lot of elite athletes, which is really interesting. You can leave comments and kudos, join monthly challenges for distance and elevation gain, upload photos from your run, and set goals. Because each activity includes a map, there are even some people that purposely run or cycle to draw a picture with their activity, which is quite amusing. But anyways, the key point here is that if I go out on a run and go a bit slow or cut my run short or miss my weekly goal, people that are following me will know about it. So in an odd way, I am being observed all the time. Whether this helps, hurts, or has no real effect on my performance at all is something I hope someone will investigate in the future. So to sum up, even though social facilitation has been studied for over a hundred years now, Some work still needs to be done to determine exactly why the presence of others influences our performance, when it will result in good or bad outcomes, and under what situation these will occur. So far, research has shown that task complexity, evaluation context, and the type of presence, for example, audience versus co-actor, observer or versus evaluator, are some of the factors that influence this interesting effect. I just hope I can meet up with another social facilitator on the trail in my next race. Well, that's it for today's episode. Coming soon on the Perception in Action podcast, a series of interviews with coaches and other practitioners that are applying all of this stuff I talk about in the field. If you recall, I put out a request for some suggestions a couple episodes ago and got a great response. So thanks, everyone. And if you have any more suggestions, please keep them coming. You can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or on Twitter at shakyweights. And to find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. If tears were liquor, I'd have drunk myself sick.